Hello. <laughs> Hello everyone, uh, welcome You're to the Community boy. Sunday again. Um, very special guest today, or I'll introduce in a moment, but I think uh, the topic <coughs> is about climate change basically. Um, and I'll let Tease explain what his uh, vision for the future is. But this is even more important today after the election because uh, the Tory manifesto was already condemning us to a three degrees uh, climate change rise and actually now they are doing a deal with the devil and they are basically signing up with climate change deniers so it's even more important that people who are passionate about climate change and uh, trying to fix it speak up so uh, that being said I'd like to welcome T. Speckers who is coming especially all the way from Holland just for this event <coughs> for, um, at his own expense as well so um, thank you very much for that and I will hand it over to Tees and introduce yourself. Thank you very much Neil for putting me on the spot here. <laughs> we are not going to survive three degrees. That's, uh, that's almost an impossibility. So my name is Matthijs Beckers, which is Tees for locals. And I have branded myself the nuclear humanist. So we're all familiar, familiar with humanism, right? So I don't really need to explain any of it. The nuclear part in front of it, it's particularly bad. Most, most people hate nuclear and I can understand why. So, But it needs to be there because we need it. We won't make it out of this mess without it. So let's start. The energy reality is that at this moment about half of our energy is being consumed by the West, which is us which is the OECD, which is about, you know, it's Turkey, entirely Europe, Canada, the US, and Mexico basically, and Australia, and <coughs> New Zealand. So, the, to the total consumption of the entire world at this moment is about 160,000 terawatt hours. And the OECD is 1.25 billion people. So there's 7 billion people on the, on the planet, which means that we are the minority. So if I, I've made models about energy consumption with assumptions like what if we start to reduce our energy consumption by 30 or 50 percent and maintain a status quo for non-OECD countries, which is the, the developing countries. And whatever we do in the West, it's almost not going to matter. We can cut as much as 50 percent of our energy, it's not going to matter. And it's not going to matter because there's, there's 2 billion people coming, perhaps even 3 billion people coming, and the total energy required to make them live in subsistence alone will dwarf whatever we do. So we may grow up to 200 to 300,000 terawatt hours by 2050, so that's within 30 years basically. <laughs> Of the total of the 160,000 terawatt hours of energy we use today, about 1 to 2 percent is renewable and 4 to 5 percent is nuclear. So 160,000 terawatt hours is, an, is, a, is, is a number you don't hear very often because normally it's about 25,000 terawatt hours for electricity alone. And you, the problem is that electricity is only a small part of our total energy consumption. So all the energy consumption goes up into concrete, bricks, steel, minerals, transportation, plastics, chemicals, and distillation. Distillation is, you know, for if you want to track certain chemicals and you want to have something different. So that's about 135,000 terawatt hours of non-electricity. The problem is that we cannot attain 100, we cannot get 100, and we cannot get 25,000 terawatt hours of electricity on wind and solar alone within 30 years. It's not going to happen, let alone 160,000 terawatt hours. So there's a couple of solutions we can use to at least alleviate some of the stress, which is battery electric vehicles, which are very popular at this moment, but there's a catch with the batteries. And we can use synthesized fuels instead of fossil fuels, but we need to synthesize them using waste heat so we cannot use them with primary process heat because otherwise we would only be increasing this number here. Airplanes is not going to happen. We are not going to electrify them anytime soon. The National 
Aeronautical Space Administration NASA in the US one of their key one of their one of their key components is working on fuselages engines wings of airplanes and they are only making small increments of 1 or 2 or 3% energy efficiency gain per technological step so that's going to be hard and ships ships shipping is a as a big as a big as a big emitter of not only CO2 but also very dirty and hazardous emissions because they use the dirtiest fuel there is which is bunker fuel which is just one step above asphalt so that's really that's really a thick soup of deadly chemicals then there's a problem with domestic use so we use gas heating we use gas to cook our dishes um, we use gas, coal, oil, wood, nuclear and renewable to for community heating which means that you have a heat source somewhere else in the city pipes go to all the houses and carries the heat all around and then there is the problem of cooking so three billion of us on the planet don't use gas stoves it's even worse for them, they use wood, charcoal animal feces, biomass, and this causes about 4 million deaths each year. So it's indoor pollution which kills people. And another billion or so still use kerosene lamps to light their homes at night. And kerosene lamps don't burn nicely. They, they, they are really, really dirty lamps. And then there's agriculture. So we have mechanical agriculture like tractors, combines, plows. We need fertilizer. Fertilizer is a really taxes the carbon budget because we need to burn coal to make fertilizer. It's also with silicon, for instance, the silicon we use in semiconductors and in um, and in uh, solar panels. Some of it still comes from coal burning, so it's it's basically a kiln with pure quartz in it, and you. You burn coal underneath it so you can make this crystalline structure you need to build your solar panels. So that is something most people do not know. And almost all the things you buy, for instance from Nivea, that's, that's a brand over here, right? Yeah. Nivea de Crams and such. Nivea. Nivea. Yeah, Nivea. Nivea, yeah. Nivea, yeah. <laughs> so those are made from silicon based are made with these giant coal kilns. So if you want nice skin, I'm sorry. <laughs> there's coal involved. And then there's uh, then there's the processing. You need a lot of water for agriculture. Agriculture is basically the biggest consumer of water in the planet. Because you know if you want a cow one one kilograms of cow meat takes fifteen thousand liters to grow. So that's that's incredible. It's not just the cow, it's also the feed stock we need to make, etc. So now we progress into climate change because we've seen the energy reality. The energy reality is that we are burning a lot of coal, oil and gas regardless of what we do. And we all know that it causes climate change. Now there's some idiots in Northern Ireland who believe it isn't and they're about to become a part of your government so I think you got your work cut out for you. But you know, additionally, one of the biggest problems which often goes unaddressed is ocean acidification. So we are talking about two degrees, three degrees, but before we wait, before we reach three degrees, ocean acidification may may have already killed all the life in the oceans. And when that happens, we are in deep trouble. Not only is it a not only is it a predominant source for food for humans, it's also it's also the source for one third of all the oxygen we breathe, which is phytoplankton, plankton. And the problem with ocean acidification is as the as the pH lowers, the calcifying sea organisms, which form shells as a as a form of that body, they fail to get the calcium they need to form these shells. So ocean acidification is really the biggest, biggest, biggest problem we are going to f we are going to face. It's even you know, if people are talking about an Apollo 11 moment. This is it. This is it. It's ocean acidification. It's not even global warming. 
global warming is really, really daunting, but this is going to kill us in the end. So that's my moral imperative. That's why I am the nuclear humanist, ocean acidification. So other effects from climate change is, in de is a decrease in water availability. For instance, the snowpacks in the Sierra Nevada area or in the Himalayas in, in, in Asia are declining because the, the balance between water withdrawn and water replenished is out of balance. So there's less pre precipitation that gets captured in these, in these water reservoirs and there's more discharge. So there may, be, there may come a moment when the Himalayas don't provide enough water anymore for the people of India and Bangladesh. And when that happens, Syria will look like child's play. Syria is nothing. When this happens, when, when water availability depletes in India, we're in for a, a hell of a lot, a lot of trouble. And subsequently, with water decline comes stress on food production. So the Arab Spring is said to be a result of a crop failure in both Syria, Turkey, and Russia in the early 20 teens. <coughs> so once we deprive ourselves of water, because we are doing it to, to ourselves, by the way, it's not, you know, it's not nature that is doing it to us. We are doing it to nature. So once we deprive ourselves of, wood, of, of, of water and food, we're in a we're, we will be in a world of hurt. It's, it's going to be that simple. So what are the effects of climate change? So we've talked about that, about this. So predominant, two predominant causes for climate change are often forgotten. The first one is agriculture, because we use the land wrong and the, the, land, starts, the, land, the land starts emitting carbon basically. And the second is deforestation. So if we deforest the entire planet, we are basically releasing all the carbon that has been stored in the trees for years and for years and for years. We're putting it right back up again. So normally that carbon would only be sequestered if a tree would die, it would get covered by water, and it would turn into peat, which the iris are still using for electricity, by the way. The Germans are still using peat for electricity. So, and eventually peat will turn into coal and it will remain sequestered in the ground unless us idiots come along and dig it up again. So, other dire effects from, from climate change are increased heat waves. We are all familiar with those. So, there's a bell curve and the bell curve is normally you've got one third very cool winters one-third regular winters, one-third very hot winters. And now we're off by one or two standard deviations, which means that the bell curve has moved up towards the, the warmer spectrum. And this bell curve normally uses to be a buffer for us because it, it, it helps with pest control, for instance. So as, the, so, as, so as the winters get milder, we get more pests, for instance, which means that crops will go lost. And the final thing is that species will go extinct eventually. We are seeing it already. We are deforesting large parts of Asia for palm oil. And this causes, for instance, the orangutan to have increasingly less living space. It has caused the tiger, the Bengal tiger, to go extinct. Um, you know, we are basically eating up the living space of our fellow animals. And the effects on man, they are pretty dire too. So about 4 million people out of the 3 billion people who don't have a gas stove, etc., die each year from indoor air pollution because they are burning liquid and, and, and solid carbon-based molecules. See, another 3 million people die each year from outside air pollution, which comes from cars, coal burning, gas burning, etc. And then there's the daunting, and then there's the, the really bad, uh, really bad statistic it, is that 50% of all the children under five who die prematurely die because 
their parents are cooking with, op with open fires in their homes, thanks to pneumonia. And this happens in countries which are hot, not cold, which is really strange. So we have decreased water availability, which will eventually lead to civil instability. And we have decreased water av availability and increased temperatures, which will lead to crop famines. So we have got our work cut out for us. Many people are already suffering. We are, le we are leading pretty cozy lives ourselves. So even if we would, you know, lead a less cozy life, it wouldn't matter. But we still need to drop our energy consumption. I just flushed the toilet back there, Neil. And this, this, this seems like I'm going off a tangent here, but it's a, it's a one-time flush toilet, so you can press the button and all the water goes out, for instance. So it doesn't, you know, it's not a, a small flush, big flush one, but it's a big flush. So if all of us would implement small flush, big flush toilet seats, for instance, or toilets, we would be on our way to mitigate our use of energy because we don't have water availability without energy. Energy is everywhere. We need it for everything. So the problem analysis is as if, as if, as if I haven't been talking about problems already. So the problem analysis is that we are cognitive close to, cognitively close to reason. So many, pe so many people simply ignore many realities or those realities haven't dawned yet. And the problem is that we tend to focus only on what just be before our eyes and we don't look at the horizon. So there's all sets of different problems on the horizon which are really going to challenge us to solve this energy and climate change problem. Because it's way too simplistic and naive to suppose that energy efficiency and wind turbines and other renewables can save mankind from what is coming. And it won't be enough to lift those two, three, maybe even four billion people out of poverty. So we, they won't get any new fresh water if we don't provide electricity. They won't have any mechanized agriculture. They won't have any fertil fertilizers. You know, their agriculture is like subpar, it's substandard. We produce the, all, almost all the food which is produced for the entire world population. I believe about 60% of it comes from America, and Europe. So these people aren't actually producing that much that much food while they live on the most fertile lands basically. <clears throat> so it's going to be a big problem because people are cognitively close to seeing what is happening. And the other issue is existing technology is insufficient and this is my own conclusion because I've done I've done the research required to come to this conclusion. So what I did is I, I analyzed the, the trends in <clears throat> energy consumption worldwide and I looked at what do we produce each year, so what, what is the trend? Is it going up? It's going up, it's going up. Fairly quickly, for instance, with the deployment of solar panels and wind turbines, they are really, really, t really taking off. But it's, but it's not enough, it's not enough. It's not enough to provide enough water to everybody. Water alone is going to be such a big problem that we are not going to fix that using renewables. So we need to acknowledge that current technologies are too limited and we need to invest more time and more energy in renewables and nuclear power. And nuclear power is the scary word here because nobody wants it and especially Brits, I can understand why. I mean, you've got, you, you've got wind scale fire, you have uh, Salafield, which is a, a topic of discussion. A long time ago, there was Three Mile Island in the States. There's Three Mile Island. We've got Chernobyl, well, <laughs> which uh, certain isotopes actually landed in Great Britain. We've got Fukushima. So I, I know all of this. You know, I've been working on this issue for six years. So if I've, it wasn't for that, there's also the, restore, also the storage of, the, of the spent fuel. No, no, no. That's, 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 that's not a problem, but, you know. 
I'm, go, I'm coming to that later on. So nuclear is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a problem. It's tough because the public perception is against it. And there's also Hinkley C, which has been the most biggest, which has been the single most <coughs> financial disaster in Great Britain because it's impossibly expensive. Hinkley C, Hinkley Point C. Oh, yeah. It's impossibly expensive. Yeah. What what they've done at Hinkley C, it's it's crazy. So I understand why Brits are fairly, fa fa very you know um, hesitant to support any nuclear at all. And there's also the DEC, there's also the DEC uh, thing to the Department of Energy and Climate Change, which is a misnomer, is charged with decommissioning all the Magnox reactors. And the Magnox reactors are the reactors that Great Britain built to produce plutonium, which they use in their bombs. In their, well, what is the name of your submarines, Trident submarines? Trident. Yeah. So the Trident submarines are stuck with plutonium from the Magnox reactors, which were public, uh, which were owned by the public because it was a government thing. And DEC needs to decommission them, or <coughs> needed to decommission them, because DEC doesn't ex exist anymore. 94% of their money, 94% of their budget was allotted to decommissioning the Magnox reactors. But most Brits believe that this DEC money is a, is a subsidy to the existing public nuclear reactor facilities, which is untrue because these reactor facilities pay for their own decommissioning by adding decommissioning costs to the price for kilowatt hour that you get. So let's move on. We need to increase mining capabilities to ramp up solar and ramp up wind as quickly as possible. And that's, less, that's easier said than done because the material footprint for wind and Solar is about. <clears throat> I don't. I, I don't. I have no. I don't have the figures in my hat right now. I wish my book was here somewhere so I could get them straight away. But I, I, there are 14 times and 22 times less efficient in material usage than nuclear energy, for instance. Is. But we still need them. We are not going to make it if we exclude renewables, and we are not going to make it if we exclude nuclear energy. It's impossible cannot be done. So we need to use renewables for instance with, se with seasonal energy demand coupled with synthesis, air conditioning and thermal storage. And we can use the wind turbines for baseload electricity because it's pretty good, you know. They, del they actually deliver some energy. And we need to build manufacturing facilities for molten salt reactors. I am not, a, I'm not proposing that we need to build light water reactors like we have all over the place, the ones which people fear, deservedly. But we need something new. So we need to keep the nuclear reactors we have open as long as we are unable to bridge the gap in this, in this energy reality scenario. We need to keep them open because if we don't keep them open, we will see what happens in Germany. So in Germany, they opted to close down nuclear reactors. And, it, and what they did was they realized that this was a mistake. And instead of coming back on that, on that decision, they started building new lignite coal plants. And I can know because I live 20 miles from those things. I've been to, we, we've got a uh, 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 a thri country area with a big with a, with a big tower on top of it. So, if anyone ever, if any one of you ever visits Aachen or Maastricht, you really should go to the tri border area and climb the tower, because what we, what you will see is you will see hundreds and hundreds of wind turbines, and you will see six coal plants with steaming plumes. And those six coal plants produce more energy than all the wind turbines you will see. And it's a big tower, you're 300 meters above sea level. So you can look pretty, so you can look pretty far. 
So we need molten salt reactors. Molten salt reactor, somewhat of a strange concept for people who have been studying nuclear energy and have never heard of it. So what it does is the, the current technology is based on solid fuels. So we built these um, we built these fuel pallets and we stick them in basically into a big pool and the big pool serves as the moderator which is, which is the stuff that slows the neutrons down because you need to slow the neutron down in order for the uranium to fission. So the molten salt reactor is, a, is an entirely different concept. So what you do is you, I don't know, we don't have salt here. So if you, if you take for instance a bottle of table salt, it's, it's sodium chloride, right? If you heat sodium chloride up to three or four hundred degrees, it will melt. It will become a liquid which has about the same viscosity as water. And the molten salts we use is like lithium beryllium fluoride. You can dissolve uranium into these lithium beryllium fluorides, and you can run them through a loop, which doesn't need to be pressurized. So it runs on atmospheric pressure, in contrast to the high pressure which is in solid fuel reactors, which we have all over the place. So it cannot say poof, basically, in short. <laughs> so and what you do is, with, this, with the molten salt reactor, your fuel efficiency is much higher. The fuel is already molten, so it cannot melt. You, don't, you cannot have a meltdown anymore. And because it's a molten salt, it basically wants to cool down out of itself so as long as there is no fission it will cool down so if you lose energy of if you lose electricity there's this freeze block which is made out of the same salt as which is the salt that is in the loop but it has no uranium in it and there's a little fan blowing against it so once the power fails the fan stops blowing the plug melts and all the all the salt in the system gets drained into a drain tank where it is subcritical which means that fission stops and you just can't you can simply leave it there it it solidifies and it becomes inert so it's it's an entirely different proposition it's what we call passive safety you don't need a prime minister to press a button you don't need approval from some ministry to shut it down if the system wants to shut down it shuts down and it cannot, cannot run away from you because if it would, it cannot. <laughs> so if you if you lose power, the reactor basically destroys itself because it will drain and you cannot use the stuff anymore because the drain tank has different fluids which... Where is that system being used? The system has been built in Oak Ridge National Laboratories in Tennessee back in the 60s. It ran for 5,000 hours from 1986 to 1972, I believe. And it was uh, developed by Alvin Weinberg. And the Alvin Weinberg Foundation is actually located in Britain. So these people are trying to get the molten salt reactor into Britain. But the thing has been, uh, the thing has been scrapped because you couldn't get plutonium for nuclear bombs out of, that, out of it. Richard Nixon didn't like it. Aside from that, it was built in Tennessee, which meant that there was millions, millions of dollars being invested in Tennessee, while Nixon was a man from California, and they had their own nuclear reactor pro project. So they scrapped it because constituents. So let's in, let's see. We need to increase water management because the one there's already one billion people living in water stressed areas. So we're talking about large parts of Africa, we're talking about large parts of Asia, and it's coming here as well, by the way, which are living in water stress areas, so we are going to need to invest far more energy to build water management networks so we can have water for ourselves and create water for agriculture because we are depleting our aquifers. Do you all know what aquifers are? So we there's, are a, there's one in the States, yeah. in the Midwest. It's the Ogallala. It's, yeah, that's it. It's, which, the, it's running dry. It feeds like several states yeah. that, which are agriculturally driven, yeah. and it's it's almost empty. It's dry. It takes 10,000 years to refill or something like that. Forget about it. Once yeah. it's gone, it's gone. You can, so an aquifer is basically an underground, an underground lake. 
but it, it runs through sediment so it's not really like you know a body of water but it's but it's more of a sediment which is filled with water and what we do is we run a pipe through the earth and we basically suck it up where wells go into it. yeah that's where wells come from yeah, yeah. so the the the, the the advantage of using water from a, from an aquifer is that it that it has already been filtered because it, it it went down through the sediments of the earth and became filtered so now we are pumping it up again but we are pumping it up far faster as it as it gets replenished as Rick just Chris Chris sorry <laughs> so it's water management which is going to be a pain in the ass really big pain in the ass even the West is going to struggle with it. We think that building an XXL pipeline is a big deal. I think we should have built an XXL pipeline for water, for desalinated water. Because, you know, water is going to be much, much, much more important than any oil could ever be. We need to stop deforestation in order, and in order to stop deforestation, we need to stop using palm oil products. We need to reduce our use of palm oil. So anyone likes peanut butter, <laughs> Snickers, <laughs> Galaxy chocolate bars? Mm. Stop, stop eating them, you, or at least eat a little less of them because... Oh, that's it, I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> because, because pristine lands, pristine lands are being denuded for the sake of palm oil. And it's almost all being consumed in the West. It's, it's our mistake that these tropical forests are being destroyed. But who is campaigning to the companies who are buying the palm oil to make these products? Who is trying to get them to stop doing it? I don't know. I'm sorry, that's not my area of expertise. My area of expertise is some total world energy stuff. <laughs> and I happen to know the... But we really need to stop using palm oil because that's a quintessential part of the deforestation issues. <coughs> So in Indonesia, the tropical forests grow some peatland. And peatland is basically carbon which is about to be stored permanently. So what they do is they denude the land. They basically rip out all the tropical forest. Then they burn the peat. They simply burn it. And then they start planting palm oil trees there. So that's like a double land. We lose our sequestration. <coughs> It's, it's, it's a disaster. It's, it really is a disaster. And we also need to stop, for instance, in South America, trees are being cut for, for cattle ranching. Trees are being cut for sugar cane because they use sugar cane to create ethanol, which they use in their vehicles, which sounds like a green thing to do. But when you kill a tropical forest for it, that's not right. That's not right. So that's what they are doing right now. So we need to start improving our agricultural practices because that's the only way how we can eventually save the forests. And that's imperative because we need to. And improving our agriculture practices requires water, mechanization, fertilizer. We need to educate like a billion people in the world. It's going to take so much money and energy which I don't think is wasted because I'm a humanist. I think that we need to push to maximize to maximize human potential everywhere. I don't care if we lose 50% of our stuff, but I want those <coughs> who are still burning on who are still burning wood to cook their water and to make their dishes to become at least, you know, 10%, 20%, perhaps even 30% better than they are currently because that will stop population from growing because increased energy prosperity has been proven to be a break on fertility aside from giving women you know education power over their own body giving them contraceptives etc because those are equally important we need to do those too so we need to stop expanding agriculture that's that's one of the that's one of the most important things, and we are really ripping the land up. And it's not just agriculture; it's mining; it's everything. We also need to accept that GMOs should become a part of the solution because GMOs, coupled with increased irrigation, better fertilization, machine, 
mechanized agriculture, once you couple all of those things, you get a step change in how efficient you are using the land. And we need to use the land more efficiently. And finally, we need synthesized meat. That's it. That's <laughs> Are you vegetarian? Well, yeah, I have considered it. I've tried it. <laughs> it works. I'm not yet there yet. <laughs> but I eat a lot less meat. I eat a lot less meat. That is a real, a real problem. And we need better building practices. So what we are doing is we are, we are building pretty bad buildings. So not only are the buildings energy inefficient because, for instance, the, the, the glass we have here it simply lets all the heat out in the winter because it has a very low, it has a very low, what's it called in English? Uh, insulation. insulation value. So the insulation value of a of a of a a wall, a, a, a two a double wall with insulation in between it is like a hundred times better as a window. So we are building the wrong things at the wrong place. We're using the wrong materials. We we could use, for instance, bamboo as a building material which grows 12 times faster as regular trees. We could use that as wood, for instance, instead of uh, cutting down oaks that are 100 years old. Or, which helps me to segue into a different argument, by the way. Do any of you know what the Drex power plant is? Drex. Yeah, yeah Drex is about, you know, a couple of hundred kilometers that way, right? North. Yeah. North. yeah. So the Drex power plant used to be the biggest coal plant in the, on the planet, almost. It's an, a, at least the biggest coal plant in Europe. And they retrofitted it so that it can eat wood chips. So they are basically feeding it trees to create energy, which is a capital mistake. Terrible idea. Yeah. And, well, and, and what's even worse, where do, does any of you know where the wood comes from? supposed to be wood, wood waste, God knows how and where. You don't, you, don't, you don't cut down enough trees to feed racks just by using wood waste. It actually comes from the east coast of America where there's these massive logging operations and they simply put it on barges, float it across the Atlantic Ocean and feed it here in England. So, so to yeah, and it, and it is yeah, deemed, and it is de yes, and it is deemed green energy, and it is being, and it is, and it is being expanded everywhere, because it's because you have this, you have capital, you have a capital investment in the coal plant, and it's really, really easy to convert them into becoming forest eaters, basically, and it's happening everywhere. It's happening in Finland. It's happening in Germany. So when the Germans say, yay, we just closed another coal plant, it probably has been converted. You know, those people are really smart. They don't just throw away money. They simply paint the coal power plant green and say, now it is, you know, now it's sustainable. Yes, well, up to a certain point. It takes, it takes 20 years for a tree to mature, you know, up to a certain point. You have certain trees mature faster, other trees mature slower. but. Nobody can, nobody can tell me that we are going to stop destroying forests when we are converting coal-powered power plants into tree eaters. So another option is what is currently happening in China. The Chinese have experience with a reactor called the Pebble Bat Reactor, which works with these tiny graphite balls which are filled with uranium. And the heat it puts out is almost the same heat as you would get from a coal plant. So what they do is they rip out the coal burner and they put in a pebble bat reactor. And, they u and then they will use that to generate the same amount of electricity with higher reliability than they would use to. So there's a lot of options. We need to get cracking soon. We need everything on board. We need everything. We need hydro, geothermal, we need solar, we need wind. We need batteries, we need storage, and we need nuclear. Because otherwise, we won't. That's it.